What's good? It's Wu. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you were into the fight talk. We have a very good undercard on the Errol Spence versus Jordanis Ugas welterweight title unification event. Uh, and I want to cover both of the second and the third fight on that card. I already dropped the Spence versus Ugas preview. Uh, you could give that a look. But in this video, I want to get to Radza Butayev versus Iamantas Stanionis and Isak Cruz versus Your Yorkies Gamboa. This is an unusually good fight card for a boxing event. But I want to start off with Radzab Butayev. 14 wins and 0 losses and 1 no contest. Taking on Iamantas Stanionis. 13 wins, 0 losses, and 1 no contest. This is a fight that it matters a lot even if the names of the fighters haven't elevated to the uh, mainstream boxing consciousness just yet. Both of these guys are in the most, you know, glamorous non-heavyweight division in boxing. Although lightweight has obviously been making a ton of noise because a lot of the uh, young talent that we have in the division, as well as the proven talent, or should I say longtime veteran talent like uh, Vasily Lomachenko. But these are two welterweights. This is technically for a WBA regular welterweight title. I didn't even think to really mention the title because I feel like the title is actually irrelevant. This more or less puts them in position to fight for what Jordanis Ugas is currently holding and bringing into that fight with Errol Spence. So whoever wins this fight should be next in line as a mandatory for the WBA title. Although all boxing fans are hoping that the winner of Errol Spence Jr. and Jordanis Ugas fights Terrence Bud Crawford for all four of the belts. But this is a hugely consequential fight between two young up-and-coming prospects turned contenders in Butayev and Stanionis. To put this into perspective, you've had a recent kind of flushing of much of the top and near top of the welterweight division. Whereas a year or two ago, you would have seen, you know, Manny Pacquiao in there. Danny Garcia, who's been moved from the rankings. Manny Pacquiao's retired. And Sean Porter has retired. Keith Thurman was taken from the rankings for some time. And by rankings, I'm talking about the Ring Magazine rankings, which is pretty much the most credible ranking standard that we have in boxing. But Keith Thurman was also removed. So that's Pacquiao, Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, and Keith Thurman, who has since reinserted into the rankings and is sitting at six since his return to the ring and his win over Mario Barrios. But in Butayev and Staniotis, even though Butayev is holding that lesser WBA welterweight title with his win over Jamal James just a few months ago. Stanionis is actually ranked above Butayev. So you've got Stanionis at seven and then Butayev at nine. To put that into even more perspective, you know, after the champions, you've got Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence, and Ugas who are currently sitting at one, two, and three. Then you've got the two super touted and highly hyped and, you know, seemingly elite Welterweight contenders in Jerron Boots Ennis and Virgil Ortiz Jr., you've got them sitting at four and five, although Jerron Boots Ennis' biggest win, other than maybe Sergey Lipinitz, is Thomas DeLorme, who Stan Ionis recently beat via decision, even though Jerron Boots Ennis got him out of there, you know, in like a round, even though it was a little bit controversial because it was like an arguable hit to the side or back of the head, which they try to like file a motion to have that decision, you know, that knockout ruling overturned. But anyway, four and five are held by Jerron Boots Ennis and uh, Virgil Ortiz Jr. And then you've got Keith Thurman at six. Then right after that, you've got Stan Yonis at seven. And then two spots down from that, you've got uh, Butayev at nine. And it's actually Connor Ben who's on matchroom, who's basically unable to fight any of these guys that I mentioned because just about all of them, except for Terrence Bud Crawford, we'll see who he signs with. But everybody's basically PBC. They control the 90% of the elite talent in the welterweight division. Conor Ben is currently at 10, but he's kind of in the on the outside looking in. They're going to have to be very creative with his matchmaking. But Butayev and Stanionis are both about the same height. You know, Butayev has them by about an inch. It's 5'10". Or two inches. It's 5'10 versus 5'8. 
a 72 inch reach versus a 68 inch reach. So you actually have the longer Butaev against Stan Yonis. And Butaev is actually from Dagestan, Russia. For you MMA fans, that's where Khabib Nurmagomedov is from. And Stan Yonis is Lithuanian. Both of these guys are pressure fighters. Both of these guys throw some devastating hooks up top and to the body. If I were to compare their styles a little bit, I would say Butaev likes to turn it into a firefight a little bit earlier, whereas Stan Yonis tends to keep a tighter defensive construct. I think Butaev moves around a bit more. Stan Yonis is more like a patient hunter, kind of stepping forward, stepping forward with the high construct, looking to jab. He's got a very nice jab. He's kind of selective on when he lets the right hand go, but he loves, Stan Yonis loves to throw the left hook. That's kind of his signature punch. Butayev also has a devastating left hook. I mean, he dropped Terry Chatwood two fights ago and finished him with a hook to the body. And he was letting both his right and left hands go to the body. But it was a left hand to the body that finished Chatwood. I had mentioned that Butayev had won no contest. That no contest was actually three fights ago. It was initially ruled a decision win for Alexander Besputin, who had beaten Butayev via unanimous decision. So Besputin, at least to the eyes of the viewers and to the judges, outboxed Butayev to a unanimous decision win, but that was overturned because Besputin failed a drug test. Now, that loss turned no contest was Butayev's first fight that was scheduled beyond eight rounds. He was fighting mostly, you know, one that was scheduled for 10, but it was finished in the third. He had gone the full eight rounds once a few years ago, but other than that, all of his fights, besides one that went the six round distance, were all basically finished like in the third round or earlier. So he didn't have any like middle or late round experience at the time that he was seemingly outboxed by the, you know, failed drug test taking Besputin. But Butayev is just very recently getting into anything beyond an eight rounder. So he had that tw 12 rounder against Besputin that went the distance, the no contest. And then he knocked Terry Chatwood out in the third round of a scheduled 10 round fight. And then he had the vacant WBA regular welterweight title bout against Jamal James. Now that fight against Besputin was for the vacant belt. So Besputin had won that, but then he was stripped because of the failed drug test. That lesser WBA welterweight belt was up for grabs again in Jamal James versus Radza Butayev. And this resulted in a ninth round TKO for Butayev. That is by far his most credentialed win. Jamal James has fought some of the better fighters in the division, including beating Thomas DeLorme. Not that Thomas DeLorme is the elite in the division, but, you know, he is a, he's a fringe contender, we'll say. Well, Jamal James is like a very tall, kind of a sticker mover, right? He's not somebody who's just trying to hang out in the trenches and just go phone booth style fight. To relate that to one of Stan Yonis' fights, about four fights ago, Stan Yonis fought uh, Justin DeLoach, another tall fighter who was banking some of the early rounds against Stan Yonis. Again, Stan Yonis is a very patient hunter, even though against Luis Colasso in his most recent fight, that was a no contest ending in the fourth due to an accidental head clash. That was Stan Yonis versus Luis Colasso. But against DeLoach, DeLoach was winning some of the early rounds, but it was Stan Yonis' game plan, more or less, to end at the time, he was trained by Freddie Roach. He's currently trained by uh, Freddie Roach's assistant trainer, Marvin Samodio. Before being trained by Roach Samodio, Stan Yonis was actually trained by Ronnie Shields out in Texas, but he didn't love the Texas environment, ended up going to LA to get trained by Samodio, who was actually his first, his original professional trainer. So he kind of came full circle there a little bit. But Against Justin DeLoach, again, he was being patient, losing a couple of the early rounds, but kind of breaking him down over time in a similar way that Butayev was breaking down Jamal James over time. Again, I think Butayev tends to let his hands go a little bit earlier and more readily where he's engaging in the firefight and therefore actually absorbing more blows. Stan Yonis, Keeps a tighter construct, works behind the jab, but is looking to close the distance and explode with his left hand hooked to the body. 
and with his right hand once he feels comfortable enough to throw the right hand. He was kind of holding on throwing the right hand a little bit against Justin Deloach until he knew he had Justin Deloach in trouble. Then he started to unleash the, uh, the right hand, which Sean Porter in the commentary was kind of calling for, saying, you know, if you let the right hand go, that could be curtains. You know, his trainer, Freddie Roach, was saying it as well, imploring him to let the right hand go. He eventually did and stopped Justin Deloach in the ninth round. So both the Butayev versus Jamal James and Stan Ionis versus Deloach fights ended in ninth round stoppages in scheduled 12 round fights. So you could kind of see their pressure style that's meant to break you down over time. So after Stan Yonis beat Justin Deloach, he, he knocked out uh, Janir Gonzalez in the ninth round in a scheduled 10, 10 round fight. And then he fights Thomas Delorme. Thomas Delorme, again, has fought some of the best. He got knocked out by Jerome Boots He was one of the guys who Terrence Crawford beat when he was unifying all four belts down at 140. Thomas Delorme was there. Thomas Delorme fought a competitive decision loss against Jamal James. And Thomas Delorme fought Stan Yonis very well, where, you know, through eight, nine rounds, even 10 rounds, it was pretty much anybody's guess who was up on the scorecards. It looked like Delorme was actually the more, the better technical sweet science style boxer, whereas Stan Yonis looked like the guy who was trying to be the pressure that busts pipes, you know what I mean? So Delorme was winning several of the early and middle rounds against Stan Yonis, but Stan Yonis came on very strong in the 10th, 11th, and 12th round, visibly hurting Thomas Delorme, cutting him. It was arguable whether it was a headbutt or a punch that caused the headbutt, but he started to really put a beating on Th Thomas Delorme in the last couple of rounds to where if it was an even fight through 10, then that last couple rounds performance would have put Stan Yonis over the top. As it stood, the actual scorecards were 115-113, 116-112, and 117-111, all in favor of Stan Yonis. So you could see, based on that 115-113 and 116-112, that it was really anybody's fight after the first 10 rounds. So we've seen Butayev get outboxed by Besputin again, Rule the no contest. So we, how much can you make out of it? If Besputin was proven to be taking a drug at the time, it was Legandrol, which is a substance prohibited by VADA. But he was outboxed in that case against Besputin, asterisk by that. And Stan Yonis, we saw him box very competitively by Thomas Delorme. So those were two step-up fights. And then again, they both fought kind of like the tall, rangy, mover type fighters. Butayev in beating Jamal James in his most recent fight that was October 2021. And again, Stan Yonis against Justin Deloach in November 2020. And Stan Yonis, in his most recent fight in August of 2021, that was the four-round no contest due to the head clash against longtime veteran, 40-year-old at the time of the fight, Luis Colazzo. And Stan Yonis was really putting a beating on Colazzo, but Colazzo did start to fight back and batter him to the body, batter Stan Yonis to the body a bit, kind of showing a lot of like the old man savvy where it might have been interesting going into the middle rounds, might not have been, but we know, you know, Colazzo is as game and as crafty as they come. I remember when Colazzo badly hurt Keith Thurman to the body, where Keith Thurman was dancing around the ring trying to buy time because of how badly he was hurt to the body. Several years before that, you know, I thought Colazzo might have edged the decision win over Ricky Hatton, and he's even fought in Shane Mosley. So, Luis Colazzo is one of the most tested in the game. But again, he was 40 years old, and that fight didn't go beyond the fourth round due to that head clash. So, it's tough to really make too much of it because we don't really know where that fight was headed, although it appeared that Stan Yonis was on his way to a win. Whether that was going to be a decision win or a stoppage, who knows. But what do I expect out of Butayev and Stan Yonis? I tend to think that Stan Yonis has slightly better defense. I wonder if Butayev is going to be as antsy to get into a firefight with somebody with the power of Stan Yonis. You know, we know what doesn't appear to be working against Stan Yonis, and that is letting Stan Yonis kind of dictate the terms of the exchange and letting him walk you down. So my question is, 
What if Butaev tries to back Stanionis up? Like, instead of circling and trying to stay out of harm's way, trying to buy time behind a jab, what if he tries to really put Stanionis on the defensive? Because Butaev, again, he doesn't wait too long to get the party started. He's not afraid to really start letting the fireworks go in the first and second round. Stanionis, again, that colossal fight aside, usually starts to slowly cook over time, very patient behind the jab. So I expect Butaev to win the early rounds here. The question is, is Stanionis' pressure style going to be enough to put Butaev on the defensive where his output is reduced and he starts being a little bit more reluctant to just let both hands go? Because again, he wants to turn the temperature up but he just does so a little bit more quickly than Stanionis. I expect, again, Butaev to win the early rounds. I expect Stanionis to start popping Butaev with the jab. I think Butaev is going to be hitting Stanionis with more right hands than Stanionis is hitting Butaev with. But this really has the potential to be a barn burner of an exciting fight, depending on how they react to one another's styles. You know, I kind of think that Stanionis is going to be shown to be the lesser mover, even though some people might think that he is the better technical boxer out of the two. I think Butaev might be the slightly better athlete, just movement-wise and kind of the angles that he's throwing the punches-wise. Like, he looks like he's letting his hands go a little bit more freely, whereas Stanionis throws tighter punches. So I wonder if the tightness of Stanionis' punches are going to allow them to connect with Butaev a lot more cleanly. But I also wonder whether Butaev's energy and activity level is going to be enough to back Stanionis up repeatedly. You know, I'm actually going to go Stanionis via close, pretty disputed decision. You know, betting wise, the odds here are basically as 50-50 as I've seen. I think last time I checked it, like they were both going off at like a plus 110, which is like dead even. So it's really anybody's guess what gives here because it's one of those, what, unstoppable force meets the immovable object or however that's phrased. But both of these guys are so young in their career. I mean, we've got, you know, 15 fights for Butaev, 14 fights for Stanionis. For, so both of these guys are working up the ranks very quickly. They've only been uh, professionals for about five years in total now and have only recently started working above six to eight round fights. So the fact that you're getting like, even though Butaev is holding that lesser belt, we'll call them both contenders. You're getting these prospect turn contenders, these rising talents in the division who are basically just a step at least rankings-wise, behind Jerome Boots Ennis and Virgil Ortiz Jr., who everybody is looking out for. It's interesting that you're getting these two forces colliding so early in their careers where one guy is going to go this way, the other guy is going to have to take a step back and reassess depending on the result of this fight. But I'm going to go with the tightness of Stanley Yonis' uh, defensive construct and the crispness in how he deploys his left hand, his left hook to the body specifically. I think Butaev, again, gets hit a little bit more than Stanley Yonis, even though Stanley Yonis was getting hit a lot versus Thomas DeLorme. But I think that the way that Butaev engages leaves him open to getting hit crisply. The question is, does Stanionis have the skills to catch Butaev as Butaev keeps on jumping into the pocket, letting his hands go? Can Stanionis time him with that left hand and make him pay a toll either with the left hook or even more readily with the consistent left jab? I'm looking for Stanionis' left jab here to ultimately be the difference and to allow Stanionis to edge, and I mean edge, we're talking 115, 113-ish, Butaev, man, it, and I, damn, is there going to be a knockdown here? Who is more likely to knock the other down? Both of these guys appear to throw pretty damn hard. Again, Butaev stopped Jamal James in the ninth round, but I'm going to go with, 
I'm gonna go with Stanionis <laughs> via close decision. I can't wait for this one, and it's obviously going under the radar. I love that they positioned this fight on the Spence Ugas undercard. They're doing the right thing in the matchmaking in that 147 pound division. They just need to make sure that after Spence Ugas, that the winner fights Terrence Bud Crawford. That's what needs to happen. And these guys need to basically wait a sec. The winner of this, I don't think, should get a straight shot at the title. Maybe if they want to wait it out and wait for the rest of the 147 title business to be handled. But I would love to see one of these guys, for instance, fight either Jerome Boots Ennis or Virgil Ortiz Jr. We don't know if Virgil Ortiz Jr. is going to be able to stick around at 147. The rumor is that he's having tons of difficulty making weight. I mean, he just had to pull out of his last fight against McKinson due to some health issues. So we'll see if Virgil Ortiz is even able to stick around at welterweight. But I, if he's able to, I would love to see some of these contender, prospect turn contenders mix it up. Very exciting division. And I can't wait for this Butaev versus Stanionis fight. So now let's get into Isak Cruz versus Your Yorkies Gamboa. Isak Cruz is 22 wins, two losses, and one draw. And your Yorkies Gamboa is 30 wins and four losses. Gamboa is a former uh, featherweight champion. He actually had unified two of the belts, the WBA and the IBF belts. In his be in the best of his heyday, he was beating the likes of Orlando Salido to unify two of the belts. He had retained the WBA regular uh, featherweight title for the four fights prior to that. And he has since, you know, lost to Terrence Crawford in 2014, where he had hurt Terrence Crawford. Terrence Crawford had to rally back and knock Gamboa out in the ninth round at the time that was Crawford's best win uh then a couple years after that he had lost he being Gamboa lost to Ra Robinson Castellanos that was 2017 that was probably his worst loss just in terms of I thought he was going to retire around that t uh, around that point because he had actually kind of quit on the stool in that fight against Castellanos he was a heavy fight favorite over Castellanos. Castellanos started to drop him, started to muddy waters, make it a difficult fight. Gamboa started to get caught cleanly. Just looked like he wanted out of there at a certain point. So that was his loss in 2017. And then most recently, he's got two back-to-back -back losses against Javante Davis and against Devin Haney. Both of these took place at lightweight, a division that I don't think Gamboa has much business in. Again, he was at his best down at featherweight, and he's fighting like these young 130, 135 guys. I just don't think that's the best for Gamboa. Well, this fight against Isak Cruz is also going to take place at 135. And Gamboa hasn't fought since losing to Devin Haney in a fight where Haney won just about every round. This was in November 2020. And Gamboa hasn't fought since, so he's been inactive. He's 40 years old, the former gold Olympic gold medalist is. And by the way, he had won that gold medal down at flyweight back in 2000, uh, 2004 in Athens, Greece Olympics. Now, before Gamboa's most recent fight in November 2020 against Devin Haney, where again, he lost just about every round, he actually fought a pretty competitive fight against Javante Davis. Javante Davis was winning most of the rounds, but Gamboa was having some moments boxing-wise. Davis ended up stopping Gamboa in the 12th round, and Gamboa reportedly had torn his Achilles in that fight. But a lot of people were questioning how bad of an Achilles tear was it if he was back in the ring against Devin Haney in November 2020. I'm not going to question it too much. I think maybe when Gamboa fought Devin Haney, he might have still been recovering somewhat from that Achilles tear. Who knows? Well, he's had a lot of time off since, so now he's going to return to the ring against Isak Cruz, who a couple years ago nobody really knew about. It was Isak Cruz's wins over Diego Magdaleno, who he knocked out in the first round, and then he had a decision win against Jose Romero in March of 2021, and then Isak Cruz beat Francisco Vargas via unanimous decision. Francisco Vargas, we've seen fight legendary fights against Orlando Salido, just one of those blood and guts type fighters. Isak Cruz beat him via unanimous decision, and he kind of built the reputation on those last couple fights before he fought Javante Davis, which even further kind of built his reputation in a way. But Isak Cruz is a very young fighter. He's a very short fighter, about five foot four. Gamboa is a short fighter himself, especially for the lightweight division. But he is five five, so he. This is a rare case where Gamboa is going to be the taller fighter in the ring, especially in recent years for Gamboa. Well, Isak Cruz is five. 
fight four, Crouch is even lower to the point where when he fought Javante Davis, Javante Davis, you know, basically hurt his hand where he wasn't able to throw his signature, I'm sorry, left hand for the last few rounds of the fight was basically trying to box for survival, not because he was about to get knocked out, but because his tools were compromised. Geron a lot of people thought that Esau Cruz beat Javante Davis. I thought Javante Davis did enough to win like seven rounds to five or maybe even eight rounds to four. But I certainly thought Javante Davis won that fight. He, you know, started to kind of solve for Esau Cruz's style match difficulty, which, again, is a low crouch, and he likes to explode upward with a lot of power punches. So as Javante Davis was kind of punching down with his left hand, he was hitting a lot of the top of Esau Cruz's head, which is probably by design for Esau Cruz's style to kind of lower your head so the guy's punching a lot of that. I saw Gennady Glovkin, Triple G, recently when he fought Murata, kind of lower his head when uh, Murata would jump into the right hand that he loves to throw. It looks like uh, Triple G likes to do that, kind of lower the head thing so you hit here and not so much here. Esau Cruz, his style kind of worked against Javante Davis, even though Javante Davis started to find opportunities to kind of let the left uppercut go. But angles-wise, it seemed like it was something that Javante Davis wasn't used to seeing a shorter fighter as opposed to the guys who Javante Davis usually explodes upward against and finds their chin a lot more easily. But again, I thought Javante Davis controlled like basically from round three, four, all the way on to maybe seven, eight, nine. And then that's when Javante Davis apparently, you know, he was wincing like in the, in the corner. I wasn't sure if it was a shoulder issue, elbow, hand, but it turned out to be the hand. I don't think it was ever diagnosed as a broken hand, but if you're watching the fight, you saw that Javante Davis was no longer throwing the signature left hand. So how else can you really diagnose it other than something happened to the hand? I don't know what it was, but he stopped throwing it all together. So that's why he edged a decision win versus cruising to like a nine rounds to three type of win. Or even worse, I mean, he might have stopped Esau Cruz if he didn't hurt. We don't know. But I know that that last few rounds was not the best of Gervonta Davis. But Esau Cruz, his reputation grew because he went the distance with a guy who barely anybody ever goes the distance with in Tank Davis. So what do I expect out of Esau Cruz versus Your Yorkies Gamboa? Again, I don't love that Gamboa is 40 years old in the ring against a 20, what, 23-year-old Esau Cruz. I don't love that he's been inactive for the past year and a half, whereas Esau Cruz fought three times in 2021, twice in 2020, twice in 2019, like five times in 2018. Esau Cruz is a very active fighter. Gamboa, you know, fought once in 2020, twice in 2019, once in 2018, hasn't been nearly as active. Now, Gamboa, I actually expect to win a couple, maybe two out of the first three early rounds because he's just one of those blessed punchers when it comes to the hand speed. He was one of those guys who you see him fight. He's able to kind of sit back and be patient. And he was so damn athletic that whenever he wanted, he could just jump in and whip with a psh, 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 where it's like blinding fast. Like there are certain fighters who have that special type of hand speed. You know, think Gary Russell Jr., think Zab Judah, think Shane Mosley. Certain guys are visibly fast where you blink and it's like, damn, what was that? Your Yorkies Gamboa has some of that must-see type of hand speed. But then he became a little bit too reluctant to let his hands go as is, you know, basically after that reign at featherweight. Once he started going up, you know, he had had inactivity even before losing to Terrence Crawford in 2014. So his activity level dipped like a long time ago. And then he started to take more time off, got back on the bike in like 2017 where he fought like four times in 2017. But then his output was a lot more spotty after that. But he, again, has had to manage his his energy a lot more to the point where it's led to more boring fights in more recent years because you're waiting for him to let his hands go but he looks like he's more content with psh, just throwing a jab moving around the ring kind of adjusting his trunks kind of you know taking pictures as they say against his opponent where you want to see a little bit more fireworks so I think Gamboa has the hand speed to kind of spark Isak Cruz early 
and win a couple of the early rounds. But I think that it's inevitable that as the fight continues, Isak Cruz is somebody who's just nonstop coming forward, pressure, 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 letting both hands go, seemingly unconcerned with getting hit himself, basically take one to give three, take two to give five, that type of a fighter. I don't think that Gamboa is going to be able to withstand that continued onslaught against Isak Cruz. One, because he just doesn't have the volume to match. So when it comes to round winning, I think that he's going to win a couple of the early ones. But I think he's going to be having difficulty in winning rounds in the middle rounds. And if he's not able to keep throwing enough punches to keep Isak Cruz off of him, then it's going to look like Gamboa is either running or if he stays in the pocket, I think he's going to very likely get hurt against Isak Cruz to where he's going to have to hold, might get dropped, something like that. So by the late rounds, and this is, by the way, scheduled for 10 rounds, not 12, which I think is good news for Gamboa. I think that if this was a 12-rounder, I would probably go Isak Cruz, maybe via late stoppage. But since it's a 10-rounder, I think Gamboa has enough craft, has enough wit, has enough survival skills to make it the 10-round distance and will instead lose via decision. Probably unanimous decision after, again, winning a couple of the rounds. I think that it's ultimately going to be a unanimous decision win for Isak Cruz. The question is, if Isak Cruz does pass this test and gets by Gamboa, who, again, super experienced, again, former gold medalist, again, former two-division champ. You could even say that it was a three-division champ. But out of those three divisions, I only consider one to be legit, just the one down at featherweight. Everything else from his uh, win at 130 and 135 belts-wise was like an interim belt. I don't really count that as being an actual champion, but super experienced. And I think that he's going to do enough to survive the 10 round distance, maybe even conduct himself well in a couple of the middle or even late rounds to where he shows some flashes, shows that, hey, I'm still in this thing, even though his volume is going to make it easy to score more of the rounds for Isak Cruz. So yeah, let me know what you think about Isak Cruz versus your Yorkies Gamboa. Let me know what you think about Butayev versus Staniotis. Again, I love that this, you know, undercard fight is has some very interesting matchups, especially Butayev versus Staniotis. But again, if Isak Cruz gets by Gamboa, what where do you think they place him next? The issue with PBC at 135, unlike 147, where they hold over 90% of the elite talent, Isak Cruz is going to be having, I think there's going to be some trouble in matchmaking for Cruz because the roster isn't deep at PBC in the 135 or even 130 or even 140 pound divisions. It's going to be interesting to see how they match make with Isak Cruz going forward. But yeah, let me know what you think about this Spence versus Ugas undercard in the comments. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.